good afternoon and most welcome to 1012 and today I will take a little bit from this marvelous book Richard E. Lind The Seat of Consciousness in Ancient Literature and I was on the verge of missing out on the book because I thought I had it all I had a few pages I think it was about 30. And then I realized, thanks to Kalle here, that there was almost 300 filled pages. It's not a complicated read, but it is very interesting though. It's very different. And I will start with chapter two here, which is called Ancient Eastern Description of Heart Consciousness. And this is something that really appeals to me personally. I will get into that, why that is later. It starts with a sight. Here in the way in the morning, one can die content in the evening. That was from Confucius. And here we have alone, single, casting away his pleasures. He cleanses his heart and rejoices. Nirvana is his. He knows the roots of knowledge. His senses are well disciplined. He is free from attachment. He is radiant. This is from the Dhammapada. In Eastern cultures, the localization of subjectivity or the pointer is usually into something called heart or kokoro in Japanese. Shin is the kanji letter. The following survey begins with India, followed by China, and several brief examples from other Eastern cultures. The examples given below could be multiplied many times with more examples from each major culture and with additional cultures but the point is simply to demonstrate the presence and similar understanding of the heart soul in these ancient eastern cultures so that the likelihood of the existence of a hypothetical worldwide consensus of ancient cultures is, re is in regard to the role of heart in consciousness can be reasonably assumed. The hypothesis of Richard E. Lind is that all cultures share his heart consciousness. And that was uh, the case with our culture as well before, well, before the event of antiquity. The discourse of the heart was a very prominent feature in ancient Eastern religions so much that it seems likely that its apparent absence in much of the later religious literature, for instance, Zen Buddhism, was primarily due to its being taken for granted or renamed. Another factor that may have contributed to the relatively infrequent mention of the heart soul in later Eastern religious literature was the Buddhist denial of the reality of the Atman or the soul, which tended to discourage the traditional Upanishad form or referring to enlightened heart Atman as the seat of the soul. <clears throat> like much of ancient Western literature, in general religious literature in the East seemed to assume that the reader already understood the pivotal role of the heart and would have no difficulty appreciating what to later readers were relatively obscure and esoteric references to the heart soul. Under the expected circumstances of supervision and guidance in this learning by a guru, the infre infrequent occurrence of these references and esoteric allusions to the heart would not be a problem. Also in some of these literatures 
the role of the heart faded because in more advanced spiritual attainment the body as a whole was full of phenomena e.g. all the seven chakras so forth and the unification the pole or the column of light Let's go through the spine and up out of the head that was typically as yet underdeveloped or absent from the more restricted range of experience associated with the earlier initiatory stage experience in the heart focal point. We have a thing here, something taken from two authors, Muller Ortega from 1989. That a doctrine of the heart was well established rather than rather early on in India can be determined by the cursory reference to it in later texts such as the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutra. These later authors seem to take for granted that the audience would be well acquainted with the heart for they do not elaborate on the concept. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, cite, quote, I make my dwelling in the heart of all. And in the region of the heart of all contingent being dwells the Lord, twirling them hither and thither by his uncanny power, like puppets mounted on a machine. There is a similar brief reference to the heart in the Yoga Sutra. Quote, by practicing samyama of the heart, knowledge of the mind is acquired. That's an interesting point that you often, uh, you do not often stumble across verbal expression of the heart since it's well established already in the culture and the thinking and therefore you can make the assumption that consciousness, cons consciousness therefore is situated in the same place as it is in Western tradition. Uh, Richard E. Lind here makes a contrary claim and it says it's so deeply entrenched in the culture so it doesn't need any mentioning. The earliest religious literature of India, the Rig Veda Sanhita, were primarily composed by and later revised by several families. According to the legendary accounts of the history of the text, the later descendants of the families who authored this text directly inherited the, the talents of the ancestors and used their ancestral vision, D possibly in a direct transmission through communication with their deceased ancestors to give expression to the inspiration of their heart souls, primarily in the form of those ritual prayers that could appropriately be communicated in written form. Direct reference to the heart in the 30th to the 13th century BCE. Uh, Rig Veda occur close to a hundred times, but indirect references, e.g. to several synonyms, and to the deity residing in the heart, multiply this number into thousands. The Vedic heart soul Vedic, it's referring to the Rig Veda, it's the adjectives, but sort of a noun adjective. The Vedic heart soul was described as the place where expectations were formulated, secrets and mysteries disclosed and answers found, where the gods came to know humans by speaking to them and hearing what they had to say. Thoughts were expressed visions received and sacred texts composed in the heart souls of the Vedic seers. On 
One way that the gods communicated through the heart soul was by creating a state of being. That is, their presence was signaled by virtue of the transformation of consciousness that occurred through their influence or embodiment and by specific qualities and functioning of this new form of consciousness as it was experienced by the host. One became a Vedic sage, uh, Sri, by discovering and maintaining the light in the heart soul within which resided the God who was not subject to decay. The sage or the seer and mind more son on Brahman was worshipped at the sacred heart or fire altar like the ancestors and the gods. Agni, the Vedic god of fire and the celestial ocean both resided in the human heart. And the hymns of praise, oblations and sacrifices of the Vedic worshippers were collected as Soma in the hearts of the gods Indra and Varuna. The heart was also described as the organ of inner vision, e.g. looking eagerly with their heart, my eyes opened, this light dawns upon me that is placed in my heart. The mediator between the worshipper and God by which hymns of praise reach the heart of the God and the place where the divine Soma intoxicated. The three principal external forms of Agni were ordinary fire, the sun and lightning. The Atman or soul that in the later Upanishad slowly developed into a term referring to the real or true self was prefigured in the Rig Veda in reference to the breath or mind in the heart. Quote, I look upon these showers of ghee, they flow inter uninterruptedly like pests, pleasing rivers, purified by the mind that is seated in the heart. And this is from the Rig Veda. For the seas of the Vedas Quote, the heart is the secret place of their inspiration, where hymns are prepared to offer the gods, but it is also the critical authority that monitors the hymns' value. The heart thus becomes the place of divine vision, which is only given by grace to those who practice self-renunciation. It is understood that the heart's knowledge is satya, real and true, since it alone can enable one to pass from the unreal illusory to the real. Such knowledge is transformative, for it discovers by means of the heart the divine immanence within man. When all the desires he carries in his heart have been cast away, then the mortal becomes immortal. The heart is thus the symbol of the divine inhabitation in man. Unquote. The various functions and qualities and positions of the heart as the nexus of the sacred all coalesced into the more general designation by the time of the Upanishad, mm -hmm. they come later than the Rig Veda, of the heart soul as the Atman or the Self. Within this transformed heart soul resided the impersonal transcendent principle, the place in which the gods appeared and abided, the vehicle by which one received divine knowledge and from which emanated the radiance by which the God or gods could be seen and spiritual knowledge, jnana, revealed. 
whereas Agni, the Vedic god of fire, manifests in the external fire of the hearth and altar, was the primary god worshipped in the Rig Veda as represented by the heart and the altar fire. Agni was the external ritual means through which worship was accomplished. And Agni Vaishnara referred more specifically to the eternal, internal fire or light in the heart soul wherein divine communication occurred and the gods became manifest. The distinction between the external and internal, however, was not so self-evident to an imminent ancient as it is to objective modern consciousness. The internal fire was referred to by many names, for, an, for example, Agni Vaishvanara Vayu Indra and later in the Upanishads as Brahman, Param, Atman and Atman. Oddly enough, Paramatman means Supreme Self, so it seems to be the same para as in Greek. Where the God was being worshipped through the medium of the external internal fires, this light that is placed in the heart seeks to know him. My man, mind, re the receptacle of distant objects, hastened towards him. According to an explanatory note, the light in the heart was Brahman, who was seated spontaneously in the heart as means of true knowledge to which all the senses, together with the mind and consciousness, refer as to one cause of creation, or Param Atman, Supreme Spirit. Let me go back a little bit here to to what we find in the West to compare. This, he has some interesting explanations here that could shed some light about the specific development in the West. Uh, the localization of subjectivity in the head may have been more or less, this is the West, uh, normal. The natural but immature structure of youthful consciousness that simply persists for the life of the individual in the absence of its transformation during adolescence or later into the mature form of a holistic body consciousness. Uh, in parenthesis, i.e. a transformed consciousness uniting through a descent into the body. Mind and body had an heart. End of parenthesis. Uh, just, I have another uh, second one. Or another possibility is that an unconscious unity of youthful consciousness may have become divided by the hormonal stimulations of adolescence which would normally in prehistory have been sublima sublimated through initiation rites and adult training into the imminent governance of a conscious unity of mind and body but when these initiation rituals and the accompanying expert guidance were no longer available, the typical dualisms of adolescence began to dominate conscious functioning. That is the worship of rather, the, uh, rather than the realization of mature, no, mature, mature rational ideals. I had to repeat that. Mature rational ideals is a combination of rational and maturity. At premature 
falling in love with the opposite sex and the physical maturation of sexuality without an accompanying psychological maturation. These adolescents, dualism or mismatches, e.g. unguided idealism of the conscious mind and sectional dominance of the unconscious mind, then remain fixated as the dysfunctional biases of a developmentally immature adult consciousness that because of its divisive structure this is a tendency turning up divisive structure coming in late adolescence where the two directions cannot be uh, sort of complementary because there is no guidance uh, it is in this uh, era that rights of maturity are disappearing uh, and the devices structures in parenthesis could be conscious uh, in comparison to unconscious so this is the division there uh, that turned out to be a conflict in that era and conflictual function it could not on its own without an external intervention external intervention being the guidance mature beyond an adolescent split between a conscious mind and an unconscious body I rather like this second explanation it's yeah it speaks to me yeah Kalle uh, so Richard Lind means that when you were young, so, so the, pre, uh, the prehistoric man, he saw uh, mm, this youngster's intelligence was his in the head, but when he grew older, his intelligence uh, went into the body. Is it what Lind means? When uh, the young person goes in into adolescence uh, he hints to that there is a hormone hormonal stimulation and that causes the development of consciousness because we are largely mm -hmm. unconscious when we are pre-adolescent which I can agree with mm -hmm. and somewhere in this process because there is no guidance this is what Richard E. Lind is hinting to there is no rituals that helps the person pass from uh, pre-adolescence or inside adolescence into maturity. Uh, a divisional force or strength uh, turns up because uh, the adolescent has newly experienced consciousness and that could be the seed of a split somewhere. And that split is not necessary if you have help by a guru or a guide, uh, an adult who shows mm, it, it's not a problem, I don't know. Uh, you can have this dualism, you can have unconscious parts and you can have conscious parts. Uh, my explanation would be that when you think there is an area which is conscious and then you have a sort of a blank to the next part uh, and that taking turns between unconscious and conscious is always present but what the adolescent does in his immature state because his consciousness is not fully grown he doesn't have uh, the full intellectual power uh, he doesn't know what the adults know he will make that division wrongly divide the consciousness and the head uh, sorry consciousness and the body first and then the head is a sort of a metaphor it's not to be taken literally it's not this is still the body the head is part of the body but when we say head we mean it disappears the consciousness becomes transcendent. This is how I understand it. And uh, 
he has a point there because I know that these uh, rights on maturity they disappeared actually in this era and I remember uh, when I've been traveling abroad most conscious do have maturity rights uh, like India they are extensive actually you go to a temple you get your head shaved and some of those maturity rights were actually incorporated in Christianity because uh, they felt that they should be there. Uh, very interesting, actually. Yeah. And so uh, I would like to um, return to the beginning. Uh, you had a Confucius quotation uh, where he says, if I understood you correctly, uh, Confucius said that um, he, he thinks with his, he hears the bass with his heart. Did I understand you correctly? Yes. yes. So it's a very, I, I love this quotation. It's it's something that I work on in a paper, I worked on a paper, and to show that there is really no separation between the heart and the ear. Uh, so, um, so, so, so it's very interesting. Yes, and there is. Uh, uh, <coughs> I should mention it. I'm going to mention I, 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 I want to put it in. This is a footnote. Mm -hmm. you, you who are listening, this is a footnote. Mm -hmm. So you can forget that you can end the listening now. But I, I'm going to put in that footnote. Uh, there must be a physical side to this separation. This is how I think in my footnote here. Mm -hmm. And that is the tensing of the neck. Mm -hmm. Because the head is still a part of the body, obviously. But if you tense your neck, you can sort of disjunct the part and you can sort of say consciousness in the head. You cannot literally move to the head. This is not what he, he doesn't say that consciousness ends up in the head, but it's more of a, a metaphor and a taking away of uh, the thinking. So what we see as modern consciousness is a lack of consciousness and the traits that we describe consciousness um, are usually no traits at all we it's very hard to find descriptions of consciousness like uh, confucius here uh, you seldom hear any descriptions actually i can't remember a single one to be honest in western tradition it seems that our consciousness is uh, doesn't have any properties, so to speak. Uh, Descartes never mentions any characteristics of consciousness. He just talks about thinking. Oh, it's very interesting. I say thank you very much. That's the end of the footnote, and have a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you.